Welcome to the podcast of MotorWeek, television's original automotive magazine. MotorWeek is made possible by Cars.com. Here's your MotorWeek podcast host, John Davis. Hello and welcome to MotorWeek podcast number 21. We're glad to have you with us. And joining me around our table in Studio C today is our road test producer, Brian Robinson. Welcome. Our writer who has a cold, Shamit Choksi. Still have a cold. Thank you, John. Hello. And our associate producer, Ben Davis. Present. And accounted for. All right, coming up, we'll have our lightning round. We'll also take a look at our Motor Week mailbag. Uh, but first, we're going to do what we always do on these podcasts. We're going to talk about cars and a motorcycle. And uh, these are vehicles we've recently had a chance to put to our test in one way or another. Okay, this first one is a free-for-all. Um, we did a comparison test between uh, the Chevrolet Camaro and the Hyundai Genesis Coupe. V6 is on both parts. Okay, Let's get your opinions on, A, do you think they really are competitors to each other, and how you would size up each vehicle? Who wants to start off? Uh, Shamit, uh, okay. Yeah, Can I you see to, through uh, your fog I, there? I, yes, I have to start here. Uh, first of all, I think we all need to take a moment and acknowledge that these are strange times we live in. We are comparing a Hyundai with a Camaro. I didn't We're, think. Uh, I don't uh, think a traditional American muscle car. It, it's it's really they're interesting bedfellows, I guess you would call them. Uh, I think it's a great comparison in terms of they each have their own strengths, and they're they're comparable in power. But um, you know, I and mean, we've done comparisons in the past where we've put Detroit Muscle against Detroit Muscle. Here. You know, those are buy the, for 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 those kinds of cars. The buyers are the same. I, what I'm going to ask you guys is: Do you think that people are cross shopping these two cars because they're from two different planets? Um, well, I, I think mm -hmm. GM is making a big point of, especially with their V6, is it not being a muscle car. It's an everyday car that gets great fuel mileage, that's comfortable to drive, and has a lot of power. And I'm not sure that they're pulling it off or not because yeah, I don't, I'm not sure that I see everybody that happen, that's buying them. I think is buying them because it's a rebirth it's a of the Camaro car. Yeah. muscle yeah. car. Yeah, right. That's a good reason. I mean, I mean, it is. It's a great comparison. I just, I think it's more for curiosity and fun than to say, hey, which which car is better for you to buy? Because I don't know if the two buyers. Are the I same. think it's fodder for folks like us that are looking to do kind of uh, comparison totally. tests. I'm not really sure that an awful lot of people, even young buyers that don't weren't even that weren't around, you know, when the Camaro was new, uh, like most of you at this table would automatically go look at a Hyundai Genesis Coupe and, and then a Camaro or a Mustang. I don't know, Ben, what about you? Actually, when I was driving the Camaro, I uh, ran into a bunch of kids, and one of the kids actually had an Infiniti G37, mm -hmm. and he, I, I let him sit in the Camaro because he was in love with it. And he sat in it, and he said, wow, this is actually the first American car that I'd ever consider buying. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. And uh, you would think that the Hyundai would be a more lateral move. That's yeah, true. Than a G thirty seven, absolutely. He was head over heels on the Camaro. Huh. The uh, the Camaro. I know it's not perfect, but you know some people have said you sit a little too low, and and there's been some complaints about some of the um, hard plastics on the interior. <clears throat> I personally like it, but then I grew up with them, and I grew up with that kind of sit low and not a lot of glass and kind of hunkered in look. Yeah, the I mean the original Camaro was more or less budget on the inside as well. Yeah, yeah. starting. Um, I don't care. Well, I shouldn't say that. The, the The Hyundai styling of the Genesis Coupe is sporty. Uh, it's a little generic, kind of looks like a lot of other Asian coupes. Right. I can't get past the fact that it just looks like another Tiburon, even though yeah. obviously it's a rear drive car now. Yeah, right? it's it's definitely yeah. homogenized, and that's the that's the thing here. I mean, Camaro just kills it in, in exterior looks. People, yeah. when you drive that thing, people are breaking their necks to look at it. What about driving, though? I mean, comparing the two, how they drive. <coughs> I've driven both of them at the track, and uh, you know, being a muscle car guy, it's hard to say, but the, the Camaro just feels so big and heavy on the track. It's like all you can do to muscle the thing through the corners, whereas the the uh, Genesis feels like almost light and nimble mm -hmm. in comparison. Yeah. I mean, the Camaro, you're constantly thinking, man, this thing should be better than what it is, whereas the Genesis, you're like, wow, this thing's really uh, light and nimble. I wasn't expecting this. We should point out that we're testing here the V6 Camaro, not the V8 against, which is, so that's their entry-level car against the top-line Genesis Coupe, which is a V6. Yeah, right. and the Camaro's actually cheaper, yeah. which you wouldn't think would be the case. But, right. yeah. 
Well, the Genesis being a premium brand, I can see why they charge more. But actually, the base Camaro with a six is a very good bargain. Twenty-two thousand. Yeah, that's a, it's a great bargain. Yep. So, if you had to put your money down on one of them, what would you buy? I'm not taking that one. Oh, come on, come on. <laughs> I uh, I actually like the Hyundai better as an everyday driver. Do you like the Hyundai better, as but I would driver. buy the Camaro simply yeah. because why it stands out. I, I, I absolutely, it's a beautiful car and. Uh, it's got well, a great heritage. Yeah. Everyone buys a car based on styling. Everyone knows that. So. No one will admit it, yeah. but that's true. Yeah. yeah, same thing. I'd have to go with the Camaro. Okay, so uh, the Camaro versus Hyundai Genesis Coupe, uh, a very interesting comparison that uh, you've uh, heard it here first, but coming up soon on Motor Week. Uh, Kia Forte, both sedan and coupe. Um, here is a, a vehicle. We've uh, had the four-door sedan here in, at Motor Week. Uh, Brian Robinson just came back from Korea to drive the coupe. Uh, let me start. This is a uh, compact car. Uh, you've seen the ads on TV talking about how different it is. Uh, looks a little bit like sort of a, 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 a Civic with more flatter sides. But what a revelation in driving it. Like everything that Kia and Hyundai do, every time they come out with a new model, it's an amazing jump from the previous model. Comparing this to a Spectra, it's not even oh, wow. uh, in the same class. So uh, very tight, uh, well done. Um, fits fuel like economy, glove. not bad. Uh, ben? Uh, ergonomically, it fits like a glove. You just jump right into it. Uh, gauge cluster is perfect. Steering wheel is perfect. Everything's within the perfect reach. Uh, materials inside look great. Um, it's a fun car to drive, and it's got a lot of options. Doors were fairly solid, not as solid as, say, a Honda, a Toyota, but pretty close. O- overall, solid, definitely a solid car. Comfortable seats? Comfortable mm-hmm. seats. And, and you know, I we were just talking about styling with the Camaro, but even styling with this car, it's just it's a it's a handsome car. I mean, especially compared to the Spectre. It's not, mm-hmm. a, it's not a bad-looking car. It doesn't be. look like a disposable car anymore. No. Not at all. They've got uh, some striking paint colors, too, which helps to, uh, in a sea of cars like this, uh, everything it silver. helps to have a little bit of impact. Yeah, the yeah. blue that we had was, I thought, was incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Brian, what about the uh, coupe? Uh, the coupe, yeah. It's uh, similar to the sedan in styling. Just uh, a little. The only body panel, I think they share is the hood, but it's similar. it looks very similar. But uh, just, you know, some different lines. A little sportier. Did you feel it was sportier? Did it deliver on its looks? I mean, that's their whole case, saying, you know, this is a sportier version, et cetera. Um, Well, I've driven the sedan on the track, and I was very, very impressed uh, with just, you know, very nimble, quick-handling car. But I haven't driven the coupe on the track yet. But just based on riding on the street, you know, it's certainly every bit as good. I'm not sure how much better it is than the sedan, but the sedan is very impressive. Real challenger for... uh Corolla, Civic, et cetera. I think definitely. Yeah, yeah for okay. a lot for less uh, money. I would agree. Yep. Uh, their ads make a big deal about how many um, um, standard features it has: XM radio standard, uh, iPod interconnect. Well, both uh, sedan and the coupe. I've only driven the top of the line SX. So right. So it's hard. Given they, us no, no one ever lets us really drive the, the, base, the base model. model. Which, yeah, I, you know, I'll reserve judgment until I get in one of those. Brian, I'm going to stick with you as we go from four wheels to two. The Honda DN01, um, one of the most unusual, I guess, motorcycles that we've uh, had here in a long time. Uh, What's so unusual about it? Well, Honda considers it the first crossover motorcycle. Basically, uh, you take the riding position and comfort of a cruiser, uh, combine that with the styling of a modern sport bike, and throw in the easiness uh, to ride of a scooter. And uh, you come up with a crossover motorcycle. Uh, elaborate on that last aspect. What makes it so easy to drive like a scooter? Uh, just uh, compared to a yeah. normal bike. automatic transmission, it's going to be the that's the big, big thing. thing. Yeah, um, it's the same that Honda's had in their ATVs for a while. So uh, you know, it's not like it's all new as far as uh, you have to worry about it not being reliable. I mean, certainly tested, and uh, it's got six. You can manually shift between six, uh, you know, simulated gears. And it's very fun to very fun to ride. M- now you thought it was fun to ride. You're yeah. a diehard motorcycle, rider, sure, and you enjoyed it. Yeah, very much so. And it's I didn't miss not shifting at all. You know, most people would be like, "Well, it's not a real motorcycle and not shifting gears." But and I, maybe I thought that way a little bit myself. But you know, after getting used to not pulling a clutch in, uh, man, I just leave it in drive and take off and not have to worry about it. Now you had an issue with price. 
Uh, it is pricey, about fifteen thousand. So, uh, you know, certainly a lot of bikes that that I would rather have for that money. But uh, and it's a big step up from a scooter. You know, if you're if they're trying to get that market of of someone that's been in a scooter and wants to step up to a motorcycle, uh, but wants something a little friendlier. Uh, you know, I'm not sure that they can get into the, uh, that buyer. But for someone who wants the next uh, greatest thing that no one else has, you know, this this could be it. Comfortable bike probably to commute in. Yeah, well, no doubt. And, you know, high 40s fuel mileage, which I thought maybe it would be a little better. But I, I guess with the automatic, it kind of uh, takes a little out of that. But certainly a good everyday bike. There is no storage at all in it, which is kind of another downer if you're coming out of a scooter and you're used to putting ton- a ton of stuff under the seat. Uh, so that might be uh, another down. But, so you got to uh, add bags or something yeah, to it. Yeah, Anybody else have any comments well, I, on it? I heard uh, Brian Roberts, our producer, who's also a big motorcycle guy, talking about it. And he, he said the same thing. He just found it to be a lot of fun. He drove it back and forth to home a few times. Yeah, and he, I mean, didn't the two of you get in, pretty much agree that it's just a fun yeah. two-wheeler? Yeah, and it's just uh, you know just a basic uh, fun motorcycle. Gosh, yeah. it's a beautiful bike. I will say that. It's, re- it's one of the prettiest bikes we've had in here from, from say, anyone other than an Italian motor- mm-hmm. motorcycle company. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's the Honda DN01, uh, a motorcycle that's uh, a crossover and with a lot difference uh, than your typical uh, cruiser or uh, commuter bike. Let's go on to our lightning round now. This is where our, our MotorWeek gang here, all of us have two minutes to make a comment about uh, the question we've got today. And when that two minutes is up, we will hear the bell from Michelle. And here it is. Uh, gosh, okay, guys, put on your memory hats. The K car, ubiquitous K car, saved Chrysler, and Taurus turned around Ford's fortunes. What new vehicles do you think are most likely to quote unquote save the U.S. auto industry or be game changers? Who would like to start? Well, if we knew the answer to that, I, I, really I think don't, we'd go buy yeah. some stock and whatever I company was involved. I don't think they have it right now. I mean, I think that's the problem. I think someone needs to come up with it. I quick. Think, I think Chevy Volt, potentially. Yeah, potentially the Volt. I mean, that's uh, – and we step back and look at the landscape. Uh, for General Motors, they've got almost everything riding on the Chevy Volt, which is their electric car, extended range electric car with up to 40 miles range on battery and 600 miles with the engine uh, doing acting as a generator. Uh, Ford, I think you can make an argument that the new Taurus – uh, which comes out right about now. I'm surprised that Fusion didn't do it. Fusion's yeah. done pretty well. I mean, Ford's the only uh, domestic automaker that's actually upping sales uh, forecast for the fall. So they're they're doing okay. But I think Fusion, you know, when you relaunch a vehicle after it didn't go over the first time, it's always hard to make it go the second time. Taurus is an excellent uh, new car for them, but it's very pricey. I don't see it being a mass, you know. You know, car everyone's going to jump into and change the game. Well, it's a mid it mid there. It's a mid sized car, but they're pricing it higher. It's actually almost a full size yeah, car, it is a really, because it's yeah. based it's on the old the, uh, the the five hundred and uh, old Taurus ch- yeah. chassis. Yeah. What about Camaro? Anybody feel? Like uh, I think that? Camaro, uh, but it's limited volume, right? But gets people in the showrooms. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, the big, I mean, you can make a case that. You know, Cadillac's got the CTS, Buick's like got the LaCrosse. I mean, GM right now, the new Equinox, which is the first uh, crossover utility hybrid diesel or not that gets 32 miles per gallon on the highway. You can make a case that GM's got a pretty darn good portfolio now that they're out of bankruptcy to start building on, with the Volt being the one that everybody's hoping will uh, be the holy grail. Savior. <laughs> and Ford, with their EcoBoost engines, they've done okay. But what about Chrysler? Huh. What, what, we don't know what they've got. I mean, they can't do it on the Fiat 500. Hmm. I think that's one of the world's mysteries. Yeah, I mean, I think if there was one that we we really don't have an answer for, and uh, they're all making be... good products, but there's nothing that's going to keep people from buying Civics and Camrys. Right. You know? Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay, okay, okay. We get the point. <laughs> uh, thanks, everybody. Okay, let's move on now to our Motor Week mailbag. And let me remind you, if you've got a question that you'd like us to answer on a podcast, visit our website, www.motorweek.org, or you can also get to us at pbs.org slash motorweek. You can submit your question. If chosen, you'll receive a free Motor Week T-shirt. Amazing. And that's I, uh, I just can't it. live without it. Yeah. All right, here's the question from Bill in North. Riverside, Illinois, he asked, 
My impression is that automakers and the buying public have begun to view twin clutch transmissions as the gold standard of performance and economy. Should we anticipate that a manufacturer will move up to the ante, will move the ante up by offering a triple clutch system, or is the very notion a, a non-starter? I don't. I don't know. The whole advantage of twin clutches is that you have one gear engaged while you're using the other one, and you're simply basically switching from one gear to the next with no lag. Triple yeah. clutch wouldn't do anything. Yeah, you have odd gears on one side and even gears on the other side, and you can, like, change instantly between the two. So, yeah, I'm not sure. What There's no mean. lag. I mean, it's a Formula One race car-derived uh, technology. So there would be no advantage. So we could right. have a quadruple clutch. Well, that's too, the thing. If someone's working on a three, I'm sure that someone but, else will work on a four. four but right? why <laughs> would you do it? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. The whole idea is you want to take away the lag that you normally would have from shifting manually or even automatically from one gear to the next. So your response time to shift gears is minimal. Right. Now, the big question is, since they are applying this technology to essentially manual gearboxes in many cases, will this be the final death nail for manual transmissions? Because it actually gets better fuel economy than some manuals. I think it could be. You drive supposed to be the high performance stuff, uh, like the new Porsche with their dual oh, clutch yeah. PDK. That's yeah. a great transmission. And there's no reason you would want a manual over that. Right. In fact, almost everybody, all the numbers we're seeing now is these uh, dual clutch transmissions are faster. Yeah, but there's there's going to always be some people that think they can do it better and that you know you need to have a true manual so they're still going to be around but, but th there is i mean i I'm, i miss it when i haven't been in a manual transmission car in a while you know because most everything we get in here is is now an automatic you know i miss that the throwing of the right. gear shift back i don't miss flapping the paddles at all but i miss that but on the other hand if i had to buy a car to live with and lived in an urban area uh, manuals are paying the neck. They'll be around. They'll just become a niche. Well, it's a niche now. It's less than five percent of the market and is right, shrinking. Right. And I think part of the, and I think that you're going to see that dual clutch transmissions uh, become um, certainly in, in Europe. It already has. It's really the the name of the game for performance vehicles, and it's starting to spread to the Asians and Americans as well. Good yeah. question, Bill. Yeah, very, very good very question. Good. Enjoy that handsome shirt. Yeah. Thanks very much, everybody, for joining us for our Motor Week podcast number 21. Thanks around the table to Brian Robinson, Shami Choksi, and Ben Davis. Thank you for uh, listening. And um, I want to thank audio engineer Jim Bigwood, who once again has made sure that we come through loud and clear. Our podcast creator, Bill Mixter. And over at the Bell Desk, producer Michelle Parker. Let us know how, that you heard that, Michelle. Ring that bell. Bob what? Mixter. What did I say, Bill Mixter? Yeah, his brother. Bob Mixter. Bill Mixter's his brother. I'm John Davis. Thanks for listening, and be sure to join us here and on the air for more Motor Week. You have been listening to the podcast of Motor Week, television's original automotive magazine. Motor Week is made possible by Cars.com. For additional information on podcasts, videos, and showtimes, visit our website at motorweek.org. And watch Motor Week, television's longest-running automotive magazine series, each week on your local PBS station.